Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, well, I hope um, we can discuss further these issues that I'm going to present briefly in the following four minutes. Um, it was supposed to be a talk about the ecological collapse from a feminist and decolonial standpoint, perspectives from Colombia, but it actually <laughs> ended up being uh, more uh, a work about peasant women organizations in Colombia and the pedagogies of remaining. I'm still hoping to, you know, talk something about the feminist and post-colonial point of view of the collapse. But I actually, after working here for two months on, well, my own research and the conversations I've been having with all of you, <laughs> I decided uh, in the end to go this way instead. So maybe afterwards we can, you know, discuss further this original topic. Okay, so let's begin. Um, we, um, we've been working on um, a research program for the last uh, five years um, on that exactly, uh, peasant women organizations in Colombia. And actually we've been working with some organizations in Colombia, but also with some colleagues that are uh, working from Brazil and Mozambique as well. So we've been getting to know uh, and to hold these talks about uh, peasant organizations with other countries uh, from what we know as the global South. So <clears throat> uh, what, well, what I wanted to, um, well, the reason, uh, that we are talking, we are currently talking about peasant women, is that is because um, in recent years uh, we've seen that there's been sort of a magnifying glass over these women, uh, especially rural women in the global south. Uh, we've seen, we've noticed that this magnifying glass uh, has been used especially uh, on development studies, gender equality, peace, sustainability. Most of these theories that are uh, currently working on um, initiatives and diagnosis and interventions and studies that uh, think of these uh, rural women as some uh, starting point, connecting point, key point uh, to all these theories about how development should work in the global south. Um, what I brought here today with this uh, picture of Nelly Bedoya, which is one of the women we were working on, is to say that uh, in this talk, we are not going to focus as much on her and women like her, but on the person who's holding the magnifying glass over her. So we are going to be asking in this lecture, mostly the questions about who's looking through that magnifying glass. Why are they looking? And most of all, what has been seen, what has been said by using this magnifying glass. In the end, we want to uh, understand the categories and the meanings we use when we talk about them on our research practices. So what I'm going to finally try to convince you is that, <laughs> uh, or maybe talk and then discuss with you at the end, is that the point of view who holds the magnifying glass over rural women remains unseen most of the time in our research, in the tales and stories and projects and diagnostics we do, this point of view who holds the magnifying glass remains unseen and has been produced intentionally to be invisible. Uh, to talk about these people and their territories, um, like uh, what it says is unquestionably true and that there's no doubt to be cast upon the reality it simply describes. What I'm, I'm, going, I'm talking about is the expert voice. I mean, our voice most of the time <laughs> about how to develop the South, how to build peace, how to achieve a sustainable future, and how all these ideas and projects have taken upon the rural women to perform these tasks. So what I'm going to argue here today is that this point of view needs to be seen. 
And it needs to be seen in order, well, first of all, um, to uh, be accountable of the stories it tells, but also to make space for other voices about and other ideas about what it it's taking place in this in this area. So I I think that my presentation is mostly about the people and the narratives we use as researchers and only peripherally, peripherically about uh, peasant women. Uh, the itinerary I will follow uh, to uh, address this uh, thesis statement is first of all, I want to talk about uh, my standpoint. Uh, well, most of us here know uh, the feminist literature talk about this idea of a standpoint. So I want to, you know, discuss a little bit further uh, what what is that standpoint uh, uh, in this research process that we've been developing for the last five years in order to point out some issues that um, surround that uh, standpoint and also to reclaim space for other points of view. Then uh, I will present you some of the methodological um, uh, steps that we have taken in order to do this uh, research, uh, especially those that have to do with these uh, experiences of the everyday, the embodied practices that uh, we've been working with uh, when working with peasant uh, women organizations. And finally, uh, I'm going to discuss with you some of our findings. Uh, I mean, what have we been able to see by using you know, this um, analogy of uh, looking. So, um yeah that's that's the idea so first of all what is our point of view where is it where is that a stand point that is so important for uh feminist studies so uh what i try to um picture here is that uh, the standpoint is not like uh like like a very unified or um coherent or identity place, it is not an identity, it still uh, has, um, uh, instead has some layers, you know, of complexity, of tensions, of frictions that make up for that standpoint. And in this case, for this research, our, uh, our starting point, our point of view was influenced at least by these three uh, big layers. The first one uh, has to do with, you know, the feminist theory tradition, especially the standpoint theory, um, uh, uh, feminist studies, uh, which, um, well, in this original space, uh, what tries to do is to criticize um, the uh, how science has become or, or has been done uh, from a patriarchal, a male gaze that uh, try to uh, pretend that it is not that it is looking the reality from nowhere. So uh, to make uh, to 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 make it seem what 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 it uh, performs, what it says, what it describes as universal and true and objective, and what the feminists have been saying about this uh, male gaze over the science production is that. This idea that it doesn't have any compromise, that it is not itself involved in power relationships and struggles and uh, interest, you, you know, that motivate this production of knowledge, this knowledge production, is that in the end we feel that it is absolutely true, that it is what 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 comes out of it is absolutely and unquestionably true, and. Well, feminists from the 80s have been pointed out that it is it is actually it is not not that it is not true, but that it is uh, entangled with political, economic and uh, uh, cultural interests and perspectives that make it informed by these uh, these 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 conditions. So it is first of all uh, to uh, point out that science as a project, as a, as a process, as a, as a cultural process has been patriarchal in that way, but also that this project, that this scientific endeavor has all also been a kind of accompanied by a colonial um, project 
of uh, being, you know, describing from a distance uh, these realities, these territories, these being from beings from uh, everywhere else as a, a something that uh, maybe need to be uh, described and intervened and controlled. So. Uh, the first, the first thing, uh, the first layer is that critique that um, reads upon the uh, uh, this uh, scientific critique that the feminist theory has done, in order to show that from this perspective, there's been some feminist research in Latin America in recent years about these peasant organizations, especially those ones, those that are uh, dealing with uh, environmental issues, environmental struggles and gender struggles and social struggles. And they've been pointed, pointing out in, the, in recent years that uh, these organizations uh, in the past two decades uh, have been uh, uh, um, recently feminized. And the reason that they are pointing it out is that uh, most of uh, the social organizations that are currently facing um, the extractivist projects are composed mainly by women in these, uh, in these countries. And this this feminization of the struggles in Latin America has to do with the fact that most of these organizations are reading the place of women among uh, these struggles as the ones putting their bodies and their lives in the first line on those, uh, on those places where extractivist projects take place. And that's why mainly uh, women are the ones who are you know, in that uh, place, uh, taking up uh, the struggles with uh, with the extractivist uh, process. And uh, well, what we have seen in this feminist research in Latin America is that this research not only points out what has been going on with the social organizations, but also have been um, defending or standing for a, another kind of social and feminist science to be done in uh, the universities facing spe uh, specifically this challenge uh, coming from uh, the social movements another science that is not detached that is not that has that doesn't have this universalist pretentious or pretension or this objectivist pretension, but is that a science that is uh, uh, that is uh, committed to activism, that is connecting, you know, uh, the lives and the, and the everyday lives of these organizations and that uh, is, uh, is doing uh, the work of producing knowledge by uh, stating the interests, the political interests and the territorial commitments that they are defending on the territory. So this idea of uh, embodied science, of uh, a kind of a, 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 a science that is committed to a, some kind of activist and militancy, this kind of science is also a, something that we have been a, a, a seen a, in the in recent years in Latin America. So our, our standpoint not only comes from that critique, but also from this tradition of a, getting ourselves uh, with the social organizations and work with them and do uh, activist research projects with them in order to you know, make place in the academic uh, space for other kind of voices from other kind of perspectives. So while being in this um, theoretical critique and doing this kind of uh, methodological um, uh, commitments, we also have to deal with being seen by the social organization, by, this, by these women in the social organizations as, you know, this place where we are just academic women who are mostly uh, Blanco mestizas, which is like uh, white uh, mestizas, and also uh, mainly privileged and also uh, mainly urban. So, uh, this standpoint is a very fractured and broken standpoint because we have all these critiques, we have all these um, intentions of de developing another kind of science, but still when in the field we are seen 
as academic feminists after all, as, as people who are not struggling as they are, as people uh, in the end that uh, are trying to intervene their lives and their territories as you know the, the main discourses have been doing for a while. So this standpoint, this place uh, where we uh, stand ourselves is, is not only informed, but our conceptual uh, analysis of how to produce science or how to involve with social movements, it is also produced by the way that we have been seen and also that uh, we uh, are a, a, a place in which we are struggling with being seen that way, but at the same time having this commitment. So it is not a stable and a peaceful place. Uh, it is not an identity either. It is, uh, as it says, it is kind of a dirty subjectivity. It is kind of a mixed uh, place where you don't, where you are not a uh, entirely an academic person going to the field and making uh, I, I, uninterested descriptions about what's going on. Uh, but it's also a place where you where you know you are you have a privileged uh, a voice, that you have a privileged uh, standpoint in society, and then you go there and try to uh, work on producing knowledge about this process. So uh, this is, you know, <laughs> What, um, what our point of view is, is, is made of. And from this point of view, what, what, what we have been doing is that uh, we are trying to uh, approach uh, the rural women category, you know, the, the, the knowledge production about the rural women category from uh, three different uh, methodological gestures. The first one uh, has to do with this process that we are very much, um, you know, um, uh, knowledgeable about it and is the genealogy process, the process of historizing where the category comes from in order to denaturalize how we come to talk about rural women in the first place. So in, in this part of this method methodological gesture, we are not talking about the rural women as uh, the women we saw in the first slide. Uh, we are not talking about Nelly. <laughs> we are not talking about her. We are talking about the category that becomes a um, like everyday currency for us, you know, how we use the category when researching uh, rural women. So we, we, try to historize this category in order to understand where it comes from and how this idea appear and how does it how does it produce some institutions and some knowledge available to us so that's the first gesture we uh, make the second one uh, the cartography is to understand uh, after getting to 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 know that there's a hegemonic discourse about uh, rural women, we want to understand how it becomes real, how it becomes mat a materiality in our space, in our geographical space, how it becomes institutions and programs and projects and funding practices, and also, you know, theories about rural women and how their, what their place is in things like development or peace uh, building or sustainability practice of food production or whatever. So we want to understand in the space, you know, in making uh, the, the space visible, how does it work and how people react to these hegemonic practices of being named as rural women, because this is, you know, a category we put upon them. And finally, we wanted uh, to um, uh, understand these um, resistances that most of organizations um, uh, put uh, against these uh, discourses and want to collaborate uh, with them in order to, you know, understand what uh, their their places and their processes are. So what 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 is um, what we found. So first of all, a little bit about our context. So as you know, from the introduction, we are talking about Colombia. And uh, in talking about Colombia, uh, we are specifically working um, 
with uh, how these rural women discourse landed in a place like Colombia. So it's a global discourse, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a category that emerges from the global context, but then it, uh, it becomes something that is institutionalized within the public policy in a country like Colombia and then creates some institutions and creates uh, uh, different uh, practice among the government, but also among the international cooperation that works in the country. And also uh, uh, we wanted to understand how uh, some organizations deal with this process of, uh, you know, uh, landing of the category in Colombia. Specifically, we worked uh, with uh, Instituto Agroecológico Latinoamericano Maria Cano, which is, um, uh, a, they call it a peasant university in Colombia. It, uh, it, it's part of this Via Campesina effort of having uh, educational places uh, along the world where, where they teach uh, agroecological practices. So we work uh, with, um, the Via Campesina uh, uh, University in Colombia, which is not a university. It is not recognized by the Ministry of Education as university, but they call themselves, they occupy symbolically the name of university uh, there in Colombia. And also we work uh, with Asociación de Mujeres Campesinas Siempre Vivas, which is an organization of only women peasant. Uh, the first one is not uh, uh, only women, uh, the, it's uh, mixed because, well, that's how organizations are. Uh, the second one is intentionally only women because it was created when the uh, category, the rural women category landed in Colombia and it looked for a, a, a to, you know, form organizations, associations of only peasant women uh, uh, in, in, in different contexts. So they gave them uh, projects to, um, to start their uh, association and the only condition to give them money, to give them projects, productive projects was that it should be only women organization. So those are uh, the, the organizations we've been working with. And uh, what, what we have been able to see in this process of getting to understand rural women is uh, first um, from the genealogical uh, work is that, um, that, well, we found, you know, this discourse, this, this category of intervention, something that uh, Kalisa Alexeyev uh, has called the Cinderella's of the South to mean that there's this um, discourse that creates a victim subject, you know, a victim of everything. When when the discourse of rural women first appeared in 1871, 79 in the uh, convention for the elimination of every uh, violence against women, what we are mainly uh, celebrating uh, the 25th this month, uh, this first declaration uh, of the United Nations create for the first time the use of rural women as a category. And after that, afterwards, the category has been used to name all those subjects in the glo uh, global south that are victims of everything, of every kind of violence, not only because of being women, but also because of being rural, but also because of being poor, but also because of, in Colombia, being victims of the armed conflict. So this idea, this creation, you know, of the victim subject allows us to intervene them. This is a description that is unquestionably true, that you, we all agree here, and it is unquestionable that this is true, and that allows us to intervene these people, to think that we are going to save them. And this idea that we are going to save them is what Kalisa Alexeyev in 2020 calls the Cinderella's of the South, talking about this archetype of the fairy tale, you know? The fairy tale called Cinderella is this victim of every circumstance there is in her life, and she needs to be rescued by everyone. So 
Uh, this idea is not to say that that's not true, that this description is not true, but it is to say that in order to habilitate all of us to intervene as much as we do, we need to create, to, pro to produce this idea of the victim subject. And this moves a lot of resources everywhere in the world, including Colombia, including um, public resources and international cooperation resources. And this is very interesting to see because when we did the genealogy, we, we, we have published that already, um, we actually saw the creation in, in the following years of these institutions and how it operated in, 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 in our country. But um, as well as we have seen this category working there, we've seen that most of the organizations, the social organizations, not only women organizations, but other kinds of social organizations are you know, relating to this institutional context that has been created in many different ways, not only to resist the intervention, because that's something that happens, but it is not mostly what happens. Most of what happens is that most of these organizations are reclaiming this discourse to gain some negotiation stance with the state, with the international corporations to get some funding, to get some visibility, you know? Because most of the time, these peasant organizations are fighting against a, a process that has been known, has been called, you know, this, this war against the peasant kind of life. You know, in Colombia, at least, there is this continued process of violence that has been, you know, taking upon their territories, their land, physically their land, taking them away, expulsing them in order to reproduce the agro-industrial uh, food system. So in this case, Colombia only last year, but before that, Colombia resisted the recognition of peasants as a subject of political protection in Colombia because they are not as recognized because that's not the kind of life that is promoted in rural areas as being, you know, the path to development. So mostly what these organizations are doing is this struggle to remain, to remain in these institutional uh, 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 platforms uh, even though they know that this discourse is the one taking them out their lands, no? So it's like an strategic use of this institutional space, but also at the same time fighting other fights in their territories and within the academy. They are fighting the epistemic fight. I mean, the epistemic fight with us, the academic feminist women that are, you know, showing that these um, knowledge just exists that these are these processes are going on in, in in our countries and that they have a lot to say our category to say about our categories and stuff but the main issue right now is the territorial struggle to remain what we found is that that's the most important thing in the process, the, the cartography of how this uh, process, this rural women category works. Uh, what shows us is the most important thing is the territorial struggle to remain in the territory. Because right now, uh, I don't know how is it in other parts of the world, but from the work we've done in Colombia and in Brazil and Mozambique, what we've seen is that there's been like a, a closure of the access to the land. Most of these uh, smallholders of land are not even recognized as a rural people because they don't have enough land. So they are not entitled to ask the state for some, to access some uh, rights they should have, or most of the time they're simply getting out of, of, of these lands by the use uh, or the enforcement of violence uh, from every armed group in the country, not only uh, mainly uh, by the paramilitaries group, but also uh, the, the work uh, with the state. So this uh, uh, struggle to remain in their land is the most important thing. And the way they're doing 
this um, this resistance to remain in their lands, and this is uh, the, the the last point I, I want to make, is that um, they are uh, remaining remaining by um, reproducing their own ways of educating the next generation, because that's like the huge fight they're dealing with uh, right now. And that's why um, they are working on educational processes that are alternative to the public educational institutions that the state provides. They feel most of the time that the public schools, that the schools that are provided by the, by the state, it, what, what happens there is that uh, kids and, 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 and young people uh, go to these schools and learn to be uh, to desire to be developed, to be urban, to get out of there. So this is like a, a place, like, like a place where the displacement of the peasant kind of life is made not by violence, by inflicting violence in their territories, but by inflicting epistemic violence and making um, the young generations, the younger generations to get out of these lands and be or, or aspire to be urban, to be developed. So uh, what they are doing right now, both organizations we've been working with is uh, alternative educational practices. And these alternative educational practices are, well, in, this, in, the, in the place, in the, in the peasant uh, university case, is to um, take up on the traditional knowledges about how to um, grow food and grow food from, from, from the practices that begin with the seed until the practices of making food till the table. So this is like a, a process of um, subsistence, of surviving, of remaining that. Uh, what, what makes is that it, it, resistance is an everyday practice. It, it has to do with working with the food system and to be sovereign of the food system from the seat to the table. And from the seat to the table is something that is need to be taught in an alternative educational model, uh, which is in this case, the, the peasant uh, university, or in this case, um, the a school farm uh, place where uh, this other organization is um, bringing the children from the from the territory and to teach them every single practice that has been feminized in the logic of what is important or what is developed or what is you know um, the, the path uh, to uh, become you know uh, civil, uh, which is the project of the public school. So um, in the end, uh, what I wanted to say just to start our conversation is uh, these pedagogies of remaining in the territories um, are very interesting, are not only very interesting, but tell other kind of stories about the ecological collapse. But we need to be careful because we still have this problematic place we talk from. We, we still have this uh, idea that even though we kind of problematize or we um, interrogate or we ask a lot of questions about our own category, we still have the risk of essentializing or romanticizing these practices. And there's nothing romantic about these practices because these practices of survival are very hard on themselves. So um, the idea of bringing this up or uh, showing this kind of processes that are going on are, is not to, uh, now we have to learn from them and take them uh, as the model of what we should do. Also, this is not to uh, dichotomize these practices from uh, the hegemonic order that we represent in most of the times with our own research, because what well, what we've learned from the field of studies of alternatives to development is this idea that the alternatives are the exact opposite to the hegemonic order. And what we have seen in this research is that alternatives are not 
exact are not the exact opposite that the reality is more complex than that that uh, people are not looking to um position themselves as against you know the institutional order or the hegemonic order of development or sustainability for that matters but they are trying to have a place within that discourse but while also remaining in their territories and teaching their people that that order is the main i think the main challenge for the way of life and finally and this is the most important thing uh, we have to remain cautious of this idea that is not only part of the developmental discourse, but also in the alternatives discourse, is that these women, these rural women, these peasant women are the ones that should be in charge of solving the crisis now, because that is, in a way, doing the same thing, not only in the mainstream uh, part of the discourse, but also in the alternatives part of the discourse. It, and it is like this colonial or racist gaze that all, all over again puts the burden over these uh, processes that they are taking upon with on their territory. So um, what I wanted to show in the end is that um, this idea of reflecting on our point of view on our standpoint when doing research is to understand not that we are not allowed to talk about that, but that we need to be careful because our categories are very powerful right now. And that power among the knowledge we produce affect people's lives everywhere, every day. Thank you. Oh, sorry, these are um, the um, links to the books where the research is published. Mo both of them are uh, recently published this year. The first one is the genealogy process. It it's called, in both are in Spanish, sorry. Mujeres Rurales en la Encrucijada entre la Política y la Paz. And the other one is the cartography, you know, the 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 way the organizations work and it's called economías feministas campesinas en la recuperación con igualdad de género y justicia climática una aproximación desde Colombia that's it thank you